Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is a really a great pleasure to, to have you here. This is the fourth edition of the Nonlinear PD. And today we are going to start with uh, Thierry Casanaf. And uh, Thierry is going to talk about regularity issues in semilinear, short linear, and heat equations. Thank you. And uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here uh, once more. And of course, I thank the, the organizer for the kind invitation. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, regularity issues. We'll see uh, soon uh, what I mean by that. And it's a joint work with uh, Flavio Dickstein, Ivan Namkin, and Fred Weister. All right, so. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. All right, so uh, we uh, consider this uh, model uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation with a single power nonlinearity, and uh, we are really, or at least we were originally, mainly interested in this equation. And then we also consider the heat equation, which uh, satisfies. I mean, which behaves very much like the Schrodinger equation, except it has some further properties which uh, we, uh, in fact, uh, used uh, for some of the results. All right, so we have the Schrodinger equation, IDU dt equals passion u plus some constant mod u to the alpha times u with some initial condition. All right, alpha is a positive number, lambda is a complex number. All right, when for uh, such an equation, you try to solve the Cauchy problem, the initial value problem, uh, by, uh, usually it's done by a fixed point argument, you come across two kinds of conditions. Uh, the first condition is a uh, subcriticality condition. Uh, it means that essentially you can control the nonlinear term by the linear flow. This is essential, and for uh, these two equations which I've written, this subcriticality condition means that the power alpha is less than 4 over n minus 2s if you walk in the subalef space HS. Okay, so it means that the power alpha is not too large. And this is a condition that uh, makes sense, and in fact, it can be shown that it's related to the scaling properties of the equation. And uh, furthermore, if this condition is not satisfied, then uh, problems do occur. That is, that uh, the problem is, uh, can be shown, at least in some cases, to be not well posed. All right, then you also come across a second condition, uh, which, uh, I mean, so you work in the subalef space HS, which involves S derivatives. So at some stage, you will have to differentiate the nonlinearity S times. And then uh, the nonlinearity must be sufficiently smooth for that. And the simplest condition that uh, arises is that uh, the integer part of S, a number of derivatives, be less than the power alpha in the nonlinearity. Okay, so. Uh, this is, uh, uh, there is an issue here, because uh, the fact is that even if u is very smooth, mod u to the alpha u need not be smooth. So uh, typically if you take uh, u0 of x equals x1, first uh, component, exponential minus x squared, so this is a very nice, very smooth function, analytic, and you consider mod u to the alpha times u, 
uh, if alpha is, this is just a simple example, less than one half, then you see that this thing, even though U0 is analytic, this thing is not even in H2. So there is some, uh, some difficulty here. But then, of course, you may think, well, maybe uh, I am not smart enough. Maybe I'm using uh, too simple an argument. And with a, with a smarter argument, I can do better than that. And indeed, uh, Cato uh, came up with, a, with the idea that uh, since the Schrodinger equation involves one uh, time derivative and two space derivatives, instead, every time I want to apply two space derivatives, I can apply instead one time derivative. Uh, and that uh, essentially uh, divides by two the number of derivatives which are required. But still, I am left with some condition, which in this case, uh, the integer part of S is less than two alpha. So in particular, if you take uh, a large space dimension, then for small powers, it's okay. For very large powers, it's okay because I can differentiate many times. But for intermediate powers, we don't know what to do. And in fact, uh, uh, there is like this a big hole of powers uh, for which we don't know even how to construct one non-trivial local solution. Okay, so the question is, uh, is any such uh, condition necessary? All right, so uh, also regularity issues may arise in a, a more uh, kind of hidden way. So for instance, for, uh, in low energy scattering, if you look at the, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, then uh, it is a natural conjecture that if the power alpha is not too small, depending on the dimension, then there is low energy scattering. That means that small initial value produce global solutions that scatter as t goes to infinity. I will not go into detail, uh, but the, the main reason for this power 2 over n is that uh, free solutions decay like t to the minus n over 2. So if you look at u to the alpha, it will decay to the, uh, like t to the minus n alpha over 2, and if alpha is larger than 2 over n, this is integrable. So this is a kind of justific formal justification for this power. However, this result is known, uh, the fact that uh, for alpha larger than 2 over n, there is low energy scattering. This is known in dimension up to 3, but if uh, for higher dimensions, there is a gap. And uh, the gap can be, uh, I mean, one of the reasons for which there is this gap is, again, a regularity issue. So uh, one way of seeing that is to, is via the pseudo-conformal transformation so I will not go into details, but there is a transformation, the pseudo-conformal transformation, that transforms a solution of the original Schrodinger equation on, let's say, the half line, to a solution of another nonlinear Schrodinger equation on some bounded interval in such a way that the behavior of the original solution as t goes to infinity corresponds to the behavior of the transform solution at some finite time, okay? So this is, uh, I mean, I will not uh, go into details of the transformation, but this is a transform equation. So it's, uh, there's an I missing here, right? So it's really the Schrodinger equation, I dv dt plus Laplacian v plus mod v to the alpha times v, and there is this non-autonomous uh, function of t, okay, here. And uh, 
so solving uh, the uh, low energy scattering problem is equivalent to uh, proving that for this transformed equation, small initial values produce solutions that exist up to the time one over b. Okay, one over b is a parameter that uh, b is a parameter which you can choose. Okay, so but this thing, uh, this uh, function of t. You see that if alpha is less than 4 over n, this is a singular, this is negative power of 1 minus bt, and it is integrable as long as n is larger than 2 over, as long as alpha is larger than 2 over n. Okay, then this guy is a negative power of 1 minus bt, but it is integrable at 1 over b. All right, so for... Solving this equation is uh, pretty much like solving the standard Schrodinger equation. So if you are away from 1 over b, then you can apply any standard technique based on the strict estimate, and there is no problem in solving the equation. But you want to solve it up till the time 1 over b, at which this power is singular. And then, uh, you can apply Strickhardt's estimates, but when alpha gets close to 2 over n, then this thing gets close to 1 over 1 minus bt, which is, I mean, it's L1, but not much better. So then you get into troubles, and this is why uh, you get a hole in the, uh, in the range uh, of powers which are uh, available. All right, then you can think of, uh, all right, let's forget Strickhardt's estimates. Let's apply the simplest uh, fixed point argument based on the uh, embedding of HS into L infinity. And then I can use the fact that this is integrable. Right, but then you need uh, an estimate of HS, an embedding of HS into L infinity, so that you need S larger than N over 2, which means again that you need a smoothness of this uh, non linear term, and uh, you are into trouble because precisely alpha is bound to be small. So this is another instance where uh, regularity issues arise uh, in a more, uh, maybe, unexpected way. All right, so uh, we will discuss two, uh, two questions. So uh, is a smooth test condition really necessary? So usually it's, it's presented like a technical condition. But what does that mean? It's not clear. So the actual question is, is this really necessary? And uh, if it is, then uh, what can we do uh, to uh, wind around this uh, difficulty? All right. So uh, concerning the smoothness condition, <coughs> So I told you that we are uh, primarily interested in the Schrodinger equation, but uh, we also consider the heat equation, which is more uh, manageable. And in fact, uh, for the nonlinear heat equation, one can get an optimal regularity result in Hölder spaces. And uh, so, uh, all right, take a power, this is a power and the nonlinearity between zero and one. So this is where uh, the regularity issues will be more acute. And consider a smooth initial value. Then the standard results uh, imply that you will uh, be able to construct a local solution which will have certain uh, regularity in regularity in uh, Hölder spaces, namely DTU and uh, its uh, its gradient and all derivatives or space derivatives of U uh, 
of order up to three will be continuous, and the special derivatives of order three are Holder continuous of exponent alpha. Alpha being the power in the nonlinearity. Okay? So, and, uh, and the solution stays bounded as long as it exists uh, in C3 alpha. And uh, it turns out that this alpha, so alpha here again, is the alpha in the nonlinearity. And this is optimal. If you put here anything larger than alpha, then this becomes false. Okay, so uh, precisely the result is the following. Uh, then there exist uh, initial values, which are C infinity with compact support. And I say arbitrarily small. I'm not talking of norms now, but it's one initial value which you can multiply by any positive epsilon, the result is still the same. Right? So this is what I mean by arbitrarily small. And such that, all right, so we can, as observed before, the C3 alpha norm is bounded, but the C3 beta for any beta larger than alpha it's not on, it's not, it's not bound, it's not even in L1 for any interval ST with S different from T. Okay, so here we know there is a solution, but its regularity, its C, its holder regularity, it's, is limited exactly to beta equals alpha, where alpha is a power in the nonlinearity. And then you can use uh, Sobolev's embedding of uh, HS spaces into Holder spaces to uh, deduce that uh, for this initial value, the solution is not L1 into this uh, Sobolev space. Okay? And uh, how does one see that? The idea of a proof is, uh, I would say, as usual, a perturbation argument. But uh, usually, you perturb the linear equation with a nonlinearity. Here, you perturb uh, the ODE, W prime equals lambda W to, uh, to the alpha, with the Laplacian. Okay, now uh, the reason is that <coughs> if you look at this equation, then you can still solve it explicitly for every uh, initial value. And uh, so the prime is the time derivative, okay, so it's an ODE. But then you consider an initial value which depends on what is a parameter, in this case, x. And for every x, there is a solution to that equation with this initial value. Okay, so now you can, uh, again, you can solve the equation explicitly and you can observe what is the regularity with respect to x of the solution of this time ODE. And uh, you observe on the explicit formula, that there is a loss of regularity. And uh, the same occurs for the same ODE if you add a sufficiently smooth forcing. Adding something smooth does not uh, affect the loss of regularity. Okay, and then you end up, uh, you end the proof by a kind of, uh, uh, it, it's really a contradiction argument. And if, you, if the solution were sufficiently smooth, then you would choose H equals Laplacian U, and then V, which would be U in this case, 
would have a loss of regularity which contradicts your assumption that U is smooth. All right, so the, the argument is, uh, is simple. And it's based again on the fact that here you have an explicit uh, formula. Uh, it's useful to have this explicit formula. All right, but uh, you can uh, solve in very much the same way the ODE corresponding to the Schrodinger equation. That would be uh, IW prime equals to that. And you can uh, observe a similar loss of regularity. So you can apply the same argument and uh, the result which you get, of course, it does not make sense, to make sense to formulate the result in terms of Hölder regularity for the Schrodinger equation, which is not uh, well posed, uh, not known to be well posed in Hölder spaces. So you can formulate the, this uh, result in terms of sumless spaces. And again, the same, the very same argument showed that. So take a small power between 0 and 1, and if the uh, order of differentiability S is larger than this number, alpha plus 3 plus n over 2, so the n over 2 comes from the Sobolev's embedding, and then uh, you can construct uh, smooth initial values, infinity with compact support, for which there is no solution which is continuous into HS, for this S, okay? And, uh, okay, one, one point which I, uh, which I did not uh, explain, that in fact, uh, what, there's no, <laughs> there's no big assumption on the, on the initial value, it just require that it vanishes with a non non zero derivative. This is the point where the difficulties arise. Okay. Okay, so in particular, this condition is necessary for NLS to be locally well posed in HS because otherwise there is a problem. Uh, then I should insist on the fact that we don't know what would be the optimal regularity condition for well positiveness. Now we know that there is some condition, some condition there must be, but we don't know what is the optimal one. Okay, so uh, the previous result says that uh, there is no uh, continuous solution into HS or L1 into HS, you can formulate that in, in terms of L1. Uh, but if you look at the proof, it does not guarantee that there is a some T at which you can say that the solution is not in a certain space. Uh, for the heat equation, one can uh, prove uh, the existence of such uh, T. In fact, one can prove the following. Uh, take now, you can allow alpha to be between zero and two. And then there exists arbitrarily small in the sense which I discussed before, uh, initial values, uh, smooth initial values such that the corresponding solution which we know it exists for the heat equation, uh, is at no time in this subless space HSP if S is larger than five plus one over P. Uh, again, this is probably not an, uh, an optimal condition, but the interest here is that this 5 plus 1 over p is independent of the space dimension. And this is because the method somehow uses uh, one-dimensional argument. 
Unfortunately, uh, this does not apply to the Schrodinger equation. Uh, I hardly can imagine that the Schrodinger equation will be better behaved than the heat equation. So probably <laughs> there is such a result for the Schrodinger equation. But uh, our argument apparently does not work there. Okay, so uh, this time, I mean the idea of the, of the argument to prove this is uh, this time to use a standard perturbation to perturb the linear heat equation with the nonlinearity. And uh, so, as I said, the important uh, property which you use uh, of the initial value is that it vanishes somewhere okay, with the non zero deriv derivative, so you can consider. Uh, an initial value which is for x1, x1 being the first component in Rn, uh, being a function of the other variables times x1, for small x1. And then, uh, all right, you expand u to the alpha u in this form. So it's, uh, all right, so the y here should be the x1. Okay, so as x1 to the alpha x1, which corresponds to this, times a function of t and a function of the other variables, plus this perturbation, which is less than x1 to the alpha over 2. All right, then you use Duhamel's formula and you compute up to five derivatives and then you get to a singularity. And then this uh, tells you that the solution of the heat equation cannot be C5 with respect to the first variable and then by Sobolev's embedding in 1D because you use only uh, the lack of regularity in the variable x1. Uh, then you get uh, this uh, regularity, this, um, this lack of regularity, uh, or ill positiveness, if you like, result which I, uh, which I stated uh, before. <coughs> All right, so, uh, so as we, uh, as we have seen, the, the order of regularity at which there appears a problem is independent of the space dimension. And uh, using this, you can show the following corollary. So assume again that alpha is less than two and that the space dimension is larger than 11 plus 4 over alpha. Okay, maybe something large, but something finite. So you choose a nonlinearity, and then a space dimension which is lar larger than that. And then the corollary is that for every positive or non-negative S, the Cauchy problem for the heat equation is ill-posed even for small initial value. Uh, okay, we'll not go into details for uh, uh, what I call uh, ill post, but uh, it's, it's in a very, very uh, weak sense. Uh, it's really very ill post. Uh, okay, so the reason is that the, the previous CRM uh, shows ill positiveness in this case with, for the previous theorem we have p equals 2. Okay, so uh, it shows ill positiveness in the, in the sense of non existence of solutions uh, when 2s is larger than 11. So now we may assume instead of this condition, we may assume that uh, so 2s is uh, less than 11, and so it suffices to consider this case. But then a simple scaling argument shows that uh, 
In particular, uh, the, the, there is no, uh, there is no uh, delta and epsilon positive such that a norm less than delta of the initial value would imply existence up to the time epsilon uniformly. All right, so this shows uh, El Pasenesis. Again, I hardly can believe that the Schrodinger equation would be better behaved than that. So there is probably a similar result for the Schrodinger equation that if uh, under certain circumstances the initial value is ill posed in every subalef space. But this is just a conjecture as of now. All right, so uh, now we know that there are really actual issues with the regularity of the nonlinearity. Uh, what can we do? All right, so the difficulty is when the nonlinearity non -linearity is not smooth enough. And for this power, this is only at u equals zero. Otherwise, it's very smooth. Okay, so then uh, we can uh, say, well, uh, let's consider solutions that do not vanish. Then we do not have any more this regularity issue. And for the heat equation, that would be simple. You would use the maximum principle and comparison principles, and that would be fine. Uh, now for NLS, uh, this is not so obvious because there is nothing like a maximum principle. Uh, yet, uh, all right, something can be done. I'm not saying that uh, this is optimal, but one can do something. So here is uh, the um, here is the idea. Okay, so uh, now, for instance, consider an initial value which is like x to the minus n. So n, uh, small n is any positive number and the dimension is big N. It's not related, this N is not related to the to the space dimension. So consider an initial value which is like x to the minus n at infinity and which is smooth. So typically, this is the initial value. And consider the solution of the linear Schrodinger equation with this initial value. So we would like to find out conditions under which this solution does not vanish. This, this would be a starting point for studying the nonlinear equation. Okay, so uh, one way of doing that is estimating from below x to the n u of t x. Okay? All right, then you integrate the equation. If you integrate the Schrodinger equation, you get u of t equals the initial value plus the integral from 0 to t of i Laplacian u. i Laplacian u is the u dt. Multiply by xn, <coughs> takes the infimum, and you will see that it's larger than 1, which comes from here, okay? Minus, you estimate the integral by t times the soup. This is very rough, but uh, we'll see, uh, see this just to give an idea. So minus t times the norm, in an infinity space-time of x to the n Laplacian u. All right, so uh, we have a 1 here, which is good, and then we want to make this small. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, all right, let's estimate this by Sobolev embedding, and then we'll get some big HS norm which you can try to estimate by energy estimates. 
right. But this does not work because uh, to the very least you will have to estimate this in L2, right? Okay, now think of U0 being that, you take two derivatives of the Laplacian, this will introduce, this will be something like x to z minus n minus 2, you multiply by xn, so you get something like x minus 2, which is not in L2. So you will, I mean, at least if the dimension is larger than or equal to 4. So uh, this will not work. Okay, but then you can observe the following. So if instead of the Laplacian here, I use a power of the Laplacian, Laplacian to be k, then this xn Laplacian to the k u0 will behave like x to the minus 2k, which will be in L2 if k is large enough. All right, so now you let's, can do the following. You look at this formula, so u of t equals u at 0 plus the integral of du dt. You will say, well, this is, if you like, uh, Taylor's formula. Okay? So instead of using Taylor's formula, at order 1, let's use Taylor's formula at order k. And then uh, this is what you get. This is just Taylor's formula. And this is because I, Laplacian, is the UDT. So this is uh, d, d m plus 1 u over dt m plus 1. So this is all right, so what do we have here? So we have u of t, which is what we want to estimate. There was something which depends on the initial value only. So I'm willing to assume anything on the initial value. And there I have a big power of the Laplacian, which creates space decay, which is good for me. So now I can try uh, to use sub embedding to estimate this in L infinity with this weight and energy estimate to estimate the sub sub norm, norm. And this, in fact, does work. And um, <coughs> okay, so. We want to apply a fixed point argument that requires an appropriate space. Once you have the space, the rest is easy, as usual. So here is one uh, space which works. So you choose three real numbers, three uh, integers, excuse me, k, n, and m, that are sufficiently large, but at your choice are sufficiently large depending on the dimension, but then you can shoot them. And you consider uh, this space of functions which are in the space Hj for some big j. And what do you assume? You assume that the lower order derivatives are in an infinity with a certain weight. So it's an L infinity norm, it's not much decay. And then for higher order derivatives, you require that uh, the weight, the, the derivative with the weight is in L2. So for higher order derivatives, you require a faster decay. And then as you approach, as the number of derivative approaches uh, this, the largest derivative of load, you reduce the weight because you want to close the uh, energy argument. 
All right, then uh, arguing, as I said, uh, Sobolev and energy estimates, you can prove the following, that this space is well behaved for the Schrodinger equation. Okay, and then uh, in particular, the estimate that we made before in this space show that indeed uh, the solution of the linear Schrodinger equation with initial values in, in this space stays bounded away from zero. Okay. And then you can try uh, to uh, apply the contraction argument. So then you need a nonlinear estimate and uh, in fact, the nonlinear estimate is the following. If you take an initial uh, function in X in this space, which I defined before, uh, you assume that it's bounded away from zero. Then you get an estimate of the nonlinearity in that space. All right, there's no, I mean, it's, the reason is that uh, when you differentiate, there appear negative powers of u, which you control by that. Okay, so there's no mystery here. Okay, now you have uh, the linear estimate, the nonlinear estimate. You can uh, work out a contraction mapping argument. And what it says is the following. If you take any space dimension, any power lambda in C, and uh, take an initial value which is bounded away from zero in these terms, again, N is at your choice. Then you can, for such initial value, you can locally solve the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So there is no hole. For arbitrary dimension, arbitrary power, you can solve the Schrodinger equation. Of course, there is a <laughs> strong restriction on the initial values, but still, it's something. Uh, and you can also, uh, okay, uh, just a few words, you can also solve the uh, transformed equation which is obtained by the pseudo-conformal transformation in the same setting. And then you use an infinity norm, so the fact that this guy here is integrable is enough to apply the argument. So that you can obtain a kind of low energy scattering which is not really uh, low energy. In fact, you take an initial value in this, uh, in this space X, and uh, which is bounded away from zero in these terms, and you multiply it by a phase. Exponential I B X squared over four with B sufficiently large, then you can solve the Schrodinger equation globally for that initial value and the solution scatters. And this is true for every dimension and every power larger than two over n. Okay, so again here there is no hole. All the available powers are achieved. But of course you have strong restrictions on the initial value. Okay, so I thank you for your attention.